Okay. Uh, Wait again. <laughs> Oh, I was going to talk about the the part nine to twelve of the dialogues, um, and I think I will because I mean it seems weird to have a lecture with only you here, but other people are going to watch the video presumably. So. Um, but feel free to ask questions. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so. Oh, I not. Um. Yeah, so for those watching the video and for Enoch who's out there in uh, virtual land, uh, the, currently the lights are off. <laughs> um, so I don't know what's gonna happen when it gets darker, if they don't come back on, but I'm gonna start and do my best. I think it looks like the camera so far is adjusting really well for this situation, so. You you can barely tell that anything's wrong, but here it's getting a little bit dark. Anyway, um, and we have all different colored shots. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about is what Demia calls the a priori proof. This is basically the topic of part nine. Um, right, and it's supposed to be, you know, Demia says, <laughs> somehow, uh, I just, um, Demia says, since we've run into so much trouble with this empirical proof that you're trying to do, um, Cleanthes, why don't we go back to the good old a priori proof? So the a priori proof, this is the exact thing I was just talking about in the Kant class. <laughs> I ran out of time. It's almost like a continuation. The a priori proof that Demia gives is um, It's some version of what Kant calls the cosmological proof. Um, it depends. It's not really, it's not strictly a priori in Kant's sense of a priori um, because it does assume that there is a world. Right, that is, it starts with the premise that there is a world, and then from that we're supposed to conclude that God exists. Um, and it also it resembles. Um, structurally, resembles Descartes' third meditation. Um, and the way a proof like this works in general is um, that it's, what do we mean by saying we start with the existence of the world? Like what counts as a world? And the answer is basically, it's something that we're sure is not God. 
right? I mean, in the third meditation, there's actually a point where the meditator has to prove that they aren't God. <laughs> so it it's it starts with something that clearly is not God. And why? Well, it 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 has some imperfection in it. And the imperfection is such that something like that clearly couldn't cause itself to exist. I'm going to figure out where to put this. So that... <laughs> um... So, um... Right, so we start with a world. The world is just like something not God. <laughs> and we conclude to the existence of God. And we know it's not God because it has some imperfection of this kind and the imperfections are like so example one example is contingency this is the one in Kant's version um, um and also the one in Demia's version right so we say the world as a whole is not a necessary existence it could conceivably not have existed um so it's a contingent thing, and a contingent thing always depends on there, right? Because since it could have not existed, there must be something that made the difference. It's like a version of the principle of sufficient reason, right? Like there must have been something that it's contingent on. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, if that thing itself is contingent, then you're still you're still in your world, right? So you have to go back to something that's necessary, and that's God. Um, but um, um, but another example would be doubt, right? That's what Descartes uses in the third meditation. Since I am a doubting thing, which is what the cognitive argument, strictly speaking, proves, since I'm a doubting thing, um, I'm, I'm first, I'm talking as if you're all familiar with Descartes' argument for meditations. But since this is 100C and not 100D, you wouldn't have to be. But <laughs> anyway, if you, if you haven't read Descartes' meditations, take my word for it, <laughs> Descartes. I'm sorry, this is, this is really not good. But, you know, I can't raise the screen because the, it's electric. So I'm kind of like... <laughs> anyway, um, um, right, like doubt means that there's some there's something that I want to know, but I don't know. At least at a minimum, doubt involves that. So, like, it means that I have an idea of a certain perfection that I don't have. And if Descartes says, if I could have caused myself to exist, I would have given myself every perfection of which I have an idea. Um, now, like, without getting into the details, whether that's a good argument or whatever, I mean, you can see that that's. But, but that, again, is a version of the same thing, right? The world, in this case, is the meditator. And the meditator is a world because the meditator has this imperfection such that they couldn't have caused themselves to exist. And then you say, well, something else must have caused me to exist. And But then if that, you know, again, you, you can't go infinitely far back and that there has to be something that doesn't lack any perfection. Um, and that would be God. Um, um, Locke uses the fact that the world has a beginning in time 
That means it couldn't have caused itself to exist because it didn't exist before it existed. <laughs> something like that. He doesn't explain exactly how that works, but it's it's something like that. Since it began in time, it must have a cause that already existed when it started. Um, and again, eventually you get to the idea that um, there must be some cause that's always existed. And that's the um, In all of these cases, and Philo uses this skillfully, in all of these cases, you have a question whether this thing, because the thing you prove is the, basically the thing that has the, the that doesn't have the imperfection that your world has. And, you know, like that's all you prove immediately. Like that it's a necessary being, that it's a being that doesn't doubt, that it's a being that's eternal. And you you want to prove various other divine attributes. Um, and that might be, even if the proof itself is in order, that step might be really hard. Um, um, so in effect, Demia has two versions of it. The first one is this one using contingency. And that's what goes on in part nine. The second one uh, isn't labeled that way. And it's not clear if Demia understands it that way, but I think that, but I think Demia may understand it that way, but he may be unwilling to explain it in front of pamphlets. <laughs> um, so the, the second is a kind of moral version of it, so to speak, in which the imperfection in the world is the uh, misery and wickedness, of course. <laughs> That's the imperfection we're starting with. Um, so, uh, In the second case, although not in the first, Demia then gets confronted with the objection that always goes along with this proof, which the objection that always goes along with this proof is what's called the problem of evil. So you proved that the world must have a perfect cause because it's imperfect and could, therefore couldn't have caused itself. But now you're gonna immediately face the objection, hold on a second, if the cause was perfect, why was the effect imperfect? That's the problem of evil. Um, that is, that's the problem of evil in full abstraction, <laughs> right? How can a perfect cause have an imperfect effect? Um, so in the case of that second, like, moral version I was talking about, let me just write here, you know, well, I could just write here evil, <laughs> right? Where, you have, But you have to understand evil in the broad sense in which it's meant in the, pro in the problem of evil, that any imperfection is an evil, right? So that, you know, Philo keeps talking about natural evils and moral evils, right? Natural evils are just like bad things that have disease or whatever. Um, so this like misery and wickedness. <laughs> so in this case, sure enough, Demia does get Hit with a version of the problem of evil, right? And um, and it's um, right. Like Demia is emphasizing more and more how imperfect the world is, basically, in order to make this proof work better. <laughs> um, but then. Uh, first Cleanthes and then Philo like kind of turn against him and say uh, uh, hold on a second 
from this 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 world that's so crappy, we're supposed to infer that it has a perfect cause. What kind of inference is that? <laughs> um, in the in the first case, the proof from contingency that doesn't get brought up. I think. Um, I mean, why? So, like, you could say it's because um, in this, in that, like, metaphysical version of the proof, um, the answer to that objection is too easy, right? So here, the objection would be, how can a necessary cause have a contingent effect? And the answer is, um, it can't have a necessary effect because necessity is inconsistent with that concept of effect. <laughs> okay. So if it has an effect at all, it has to be a contingent effect. Um, and of course, contingency unlike misery and wickedness, isn't a matter of degree, right? Something's either contingent or it isn't. So we can't start asking, well, why is it so contingent? Couldn't have been just a little bit contingent, <laughs> right? Um, so so in that sense, like, uh, you know, Philo and Cleanthes don't, don't bother to bring up that argument, uh, to bring up the problem of evil in response to this argument. Um, I mean, I was saying you could say that. I think, I think really, and I think this is what Hume also thinks about this, that the fact that the answer is so easy is actually a sign that uh, um, that this proof really is purely a priori. That we're not really using anything about the, the world when we start with contingency, because contingency isn't really an observed property of the world at all. Um, so this proof, and this is the same thing that Kant says about it, but I was talking about in the previous class, that th this proof really, like somewhere hidden in it, is a proof like a necessarily existent being must exist because it exists necessarily which is a version of what's called the ontological proof. But Demia doesn't make that. And I mean, that's realistic in the sense that um, most like orthodox theologians don't like the ontological But they like the cosmological proof. So, um, So I'm going to talk briefly about that medical physical version. I mean, uh, it, all, it only gets discussed briefly, right? Part nine is pretty short. Philo and Cleanthes just like quickly get rid of it, basically. Um, and I think like the, they say several things in response to it, but I think that the main thing is that contingency and necessity are not like qualities we could we could conceive of as belonging to some existence. Um, nor could be they derived from any specific qualities, right? So like when Philo says, you know, from what mysterious qualities could, we have no idea from what mysterious qualities this necessity could follow. Necessity meaning that to deny its existence would be a contradiction. Oh, what properties would a thing have to have to make that true? I think Philo really thinks, and Hume thinks, that the idea of such qualities makes no sense. There couldn't be qualities that imply contingency. Contingency doesn't belong to things. Contingency belongs to the nature 
of believing in a matter of fact. <laughs> Ray, that is uh, believing that something exists. So like as Cleanthes says on page 55, I guess as long as I keep my book close to the screen, I'll still be able to read it. <laughs> um, whatever we conceive as existent, we can also conceive as non-existent. There is no being therefore whose non-existence implies a contradiction. Right, so believing something existent is believing in a matter of fact. And Cleanthes is saying uh, um, that whatever you believe to exist, you can also believe not to exist. So believing that something exists is automatically believing in something contingent. And if you remember what Hume said way back about belief, you'll see why this has to be true according to him. Right, I mean, it's it's basically the exact same argument that he made why belief can't be an idea that we attach to something, right? Because um, um, if it were, we could include it in a concept and then we would believe that that thing exists. And so we could believe anything we want exists, but we can't. And as I tried to argue, we can't probably not just find that we can't, like maybe it's just really hard. We haven't managed to do it yet, but that really, if, if something we could do that with wouldn't be belief, right? Belief has to have the role of guiding our will. If our will could create belief arbitrarily, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be belief, right? So, um, um, so uh, that means that whatever you believe exists, existence is not part of what you're believing. In. <laughs> existence is 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 the belief itself, right? I mean, or it's actually Hume says right, that. There's no property of existence, but when you believe something exists, that means that the idea of it has got some of the vivacity of impressions from a present impression. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, there's, you know, again, there's like one thing we know about ideas is that they can vary in degree. Um, that's not supposed to involve a necessary connection between distinct ideas. I think Kant will disagree with that and say that's a synthetic a priori proposition. That, that um, well, that the objects, that, that reality is a matter of degree. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so, uh, that's, you know, that's pretty much the end of the argument from contingency, <laughs> right? It's not like contingency isn't an imperfection in the world, and there couldn't be something else that didn't have that imperfection. Contingency is part and parcel of believing something exists. So the whole, so, so on the one hand, it doesn't show any imperfection in the world that is contingent. On the other hand, the idea of a necessarily existent being makes no sense at all. Um, okay, so so much for that. <laughs> Other questions about, about that before we go on? Um, so, but what about this one here? Right, so th this was Descartes and this was Locke, so we're not talking about this. Um, Philo himself made a version that involves cause and effect uh, earlier. I'm not sure, actually. Uh, 
everything must have a cause. Yeah, I mean, so Philo's version doesn't conclude to God as a necessary existence. It just concludes to God as the first cause, right? Like God is an absolute cause or something like that. I doubt Philo or Hume really think that way. <laughs> but, but in any case, let me go back to the ones that Demia makes so that this one, I mean, as I said, I'm like, I'm kind of uh, stretching things by calling this a version of the cosmological proof, but I think it's helpful to see it that way. Again, it's a proof that starts with the imperfection of the world. Um, and I think if you put it in the form of, the arg of an argument, um, um, It's actually very similar or maybe identical to Descartes' argument in the third meditation. Which is, I mean, if that's true, it's interesting because the way it comes up in the dialogue, this proof looks really weak. Right? I mean, in fact, Jamia doesn't even claim doesn't even really claim that it's a proof. Jamia is like says, yeah, people really believe in religion because of sentiment, not because of demonstration. After all the demonstrations have failed, <laughs> That's, he takes he takes that tack, right? So, um, but if you put it in the form of an argument, you could say, "Well, I find that I desire what I lack." Right now, I mean, uh, once you know the world exists. Um, you can find that you desire a zillion things that you lack, perfect health and et cetera, et cetera, right? But in the third meditation, it's only knowledge. That's the only thing you find that you desire but lack, right? But so that's why I say it's, but it's exactly the same proof. It's just the world is different. <laughs> um, so uh, therefore, and this is the part that Demia doesn't say explicitly, but therefore I could not have caused myself to exist. That is, therefore I'm a world and not God. Because uh, um, um, if I cause myself to exist, so let me try to make that argument a little bit better. If I cause myself to exist, that would mean that um, my concept of myself is the exact concept of what I will myself to be, right? Like, I mean, assuming I cause myself to exist by will, I guess maybe I could have caused myself to exist some other way. <laughs> Assume I cause myself to exist by will. So to cause something to exist by willing means you have to form a concept of what you want to cause, and then that's the thing that you make. So uh, um, if I had the power to, to self-cause, yeah, I guess you could say, well, maybe something interferes with it. But um, if you have the power to cause yourself to come into existence out of nothing, Doing like nothing can interfere with that. So you, um, so you know, you should be the very thing that you want yourself to be. If, because like you only exist because you want yourself to exist. <laughs> so you should be the very thing that you want yourself to be. If you find that you're not what you want to be, that's a sign that you didn't cause yourself to. Um, and therefore, I must have some other cause besides myself. And the other cause, again, you can ask, well, does it have every perfection of which it has an idea or not? Um, and if not, then it needs another cause and so on and so forth until you get to a being that has every perfection of which it has an idea. Um, that the same as infinite perfection? I think it's the same from my point of view, right? 
because if it has every perfection of which has a, well, it has an idea, then it at least has every perfection of which I have an idea. I mean, it made me. <laughs> so uh, therefore, it has every conceivable perfection. <laughs> um, Now, I mean, so the way it works in the third meditation is kind of like um, an ideal way to work it out because you start with this really, really small imperfection. I mean, it's just that I don't know everything, basically. <laughs> right? So, uh, um, So then you raise the problem with evil in a in a very like pure way, right? The complaint is why don't I have every perfection of which I have an idea? Um, I mean, what I mean by pure way, maybe I should say in a very abstract way. It's not a way that involves a lot of emotion. It's not like the problem of evil in the Book of Job. Right, like the problem of evil in the book of Job is, you know, like, um, how could God have done all these terrible things to me that I didn't deserve? Right, and it takes the form of like base of a like a court case against God, basically. Right, so like there's something you're really upset about. That's that's that kind of problem of evil. It's like it's. Normally, you would think that that's not great for the context of a metaphysical argument because it's distracting, right? Um, but nevertheless, Jania and then Philo egging him on um, don't do that. Rather, they pull out all the stops and think of all the terrible things they can think of, make the world sound worse and worse and worse, right? So, um, Why does that happen? So I think one reason is what Demia actually wants to do here. Um, like what Descartes wants to do is provide a guarantee that the like uh, mathematical demonstrations, uh, like the conclusion of a mathematical demonstration is certain, or something like that. Um, what Demia wants to do is convince people to be religious. Right? Remember, I claimed that 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 the the relative concept of God that Demia has in mind is that God equals the proper object of worship. So, um, what does that mean? Well, at least as empiricists understand this, like an object of worship is an object of hope and fear. That so, like, Demia is trying to use this. So we're going to use this to prove. I mean. Um, I mean, so what, like what you use this to prove immediately doesn't seem very useful, right? That is God, what you prove the existence of is someone who's really happy. <laughs> I mean, you know, like this is a world and couldn't have caused itself to exist because it contains desire. 
Um, and desire is an imperfection. Desire means you don't have what you want, right? So you prove the existence of something that doesn't have desire because it has all already has all the perfections it wants. Um, and, you know, you might say, well, okay, what good is that to me? <laughs> I'm still miserable. Yeah, desire needs to be arbitrary because it's going to constantly It's going to constantly change? Yeah. What? With, I mean, once you uh, achieve or uh, acquire, then it's no longer a desire. And you're gonna have a new Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, desire can never be completely fulfilled for finite beings, right? And uh, you know, um, for beings whose desire could be completely fulfilled, it already is. <laughs> That's yeah. Um, I. Yeah, that's maybe another way of, of seeing like what this world is like that we're talking about and also maybe a way of connecting it somehow to some of the other versions of this proof, like with cause and effect and whatever, right? That there's like an infinite series here. Um, there'd be an infinite regress if you don't have this. I, I'm not sure exactly how to make that work, but maybe. Um, um, but right, so I think you know, uh, Tabia doesn't want the conclusion to be, I'm happy. Tabia wants the conclusion to be, to the extent that I can be happy, I have to hope that it, that this being will do it for me. <laughs> That's my only hope. And I have to fear that it will make me more miserable. And that will be the basis of religion. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you're laughing, but it's not that different from what Cleanthes actually says after Demia leaves, right? This is why we need religion. And it's and it's basically what Locke said. Right? Why that's why I said it's like empiricists think that of God as essentially the object of hope and fear. Read like that's that's why it's important. Um, and I think like um, one piece of evidence for that is that Demia actually introduces this after Philo says that even if the cosmological proof worked. Um, it wouldn't show anything that's useful for religion. Uh, I can't find that at the moment, but. Well, maybe it's at the beginning of part 10. No, well, I don't know. Yeah, here it is. It's, it's the end of part nine on page 57. But dropping all these abstractions, continued Philo, and confining ourselves to more familiar topics, I shall venture to add an observation that the argument a priori has seldom been found. So the argument a priori means this argument here, the argument from contingency. Um, I shall venture, let's see, the argument a priori has seldom been found very convincing except to people of a metaphysical head <laughs> who have accustomed themselves to abstract reasoning. Um, other people, even of good sense and the best inclined to religion, feel always some deficiency in such arguments, though they are not perhaps able to explain distinctly where it lies. 
Uh, maybe that's not the exact place I was looking for, but he's saying that, right, that um, anyway, even if this argument worked, it would only be convincing to a few philosophers. And that's not what you want, Demia. You want, again, Demia's name means of the people. Right? So, like, you want to uh, make everyone religious. Um, So, um, I mean, that's one reason, again, why you might, why Demia White might want to emphasize just how bad the world is. Because the, the end product of this is that we're supposed to feel dependent. And the more you can emphasize that, the better. <laughs> um, but I know that's one reason. But another reason is that Philo is, is starting to like egg Demia on um is because philo is gonna use this as an argument against cleanthes yeah sorry this is a little bit going back a bit but in terms of like the empiricist conception of god as an object that's over here doesn't that affect the problem of evil it, in a way i guess i would say a perfect world hypothetically would be one where there would be no need to fear. And so in a sense, if God has to be an object of fear, then the world has to be imperfect. And so in a sense, if that's how you're conceiving of God, it seems like there wouldn't be a problem with people. There would be no contradiction in that. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And would that be like that God's the only perfect part and everything else is imperfect? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, um, but I mean, notice why to me, I might not want to say that in front of pamphlets, right? Because what you're saying, the solution to the problem of evil is that. And like Philo pushes it in this direction, basically. This is a way of seeing that what Philo is saying is not just a silly. I mean, it's right that that um, the solution to the problem of evil is that God is actually kind of nasty, <laughs> right? <laughs> like God, yeah, God made the world really bad, but all we can do is hope that, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> like Zeus, yeah. So. Um, um, right, so that's the situation, uh, and but then something confusing happens, at least it's, if I stand here and face the camera, I should do that, right? Uh, anyway, um, So what happens now is that um, Philo produces the problem of evil, but not to begin with as an argument against Demia, but as it like, I mean, because Philo still keeps up the, the pretense that he's on Demia's side. Um, so, um, so like Demia starts by saying, oh, this would be, a, this is a, really the real basis of religion, not thinking of it as an argument against Cleanthes, I think. Just, just saying, you know, oh, well, even if this demonstration doesn't work, people are still gonna be religious and this is why, right? But Philo says, yeah, and this is why those anthropomorphites are wrong. Because, um, Because all this misery and wickedness in the world show that what we call benevolence in God is totally different from human benevolence. And what we call justice in God is totally different from human justice. Um, so uh, this, and Philo's like, and this is the orthodox position. 
right? It's <laughs> like, uh, um, right, so this is on page 63. Part 10. And is it still possible, Cleanthes, said Philo, that after all these reflections and infinitely more which might be suggested, you can still persevere in your anthropomorphism and assert the moral attributes of the deity, his justice, benevolence, mercy, and rectitude to be of the same nature with these virtues in human creatures? And, and that, so, um, uh, I think it's at this point that Demia starts to notice that something is going wrong, <laughs> right? But it's because the argument is we can tell that God's like justice, benevolence, and whatever are infinitely different than ours because they're not inconsistent with being really nasty, <laughs> and our justice and benevolence are inconsistent with that. So obviously, it means something completely different when we say it about God. So. Um, um, right, and I mean, again, this works because the structure of the argument, it doesn't directly prove, it doesn't, it doesn't prove that the world is better than it seems. It just proves that God is happy. <laughs> so, um, And so, like, therefore, uh, I mean, here too, the problem of evil isn't actually an objection to this proof. Um, and again, I think this may be another point where there's an argument and I mean, I've already said this basically, but I'll just say it again. There's an argument Demia could make, but he doesn't make. Now, and you have to decide, is that because he's stupid or is that because Pamphilus is listening? Because again, the argument he could make would be to say that um, um, no one said the effect of a perfect cause has to be perfect. And on the contrary, what we want from this proof is to show that uh, um, we want to show this proof is not to show that we would be we will be happy, but to show show that we must hope that will that God will make us happy. <laughs> that we have no alternative. They, right, we're in, you know, the famous Jonathan Edwards sermon. I actually taught Jonathan Edwards. It turned out he's actually really interesting <laughs> in another course. But, uh, but the, you know, this famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, right? Like, we're in his hands, and, like, all we can do is hope for the best. Right. So, but I think, you know, again, Demia perhaps doesn't want to, doesn't want to make that. Um. So be that as it may, so 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 therefore, I guess kind of correctly, Philo says this argument is aimed at Cleanthes. Um, even though Demia is like not willing to accept what Philo does with it and pretty soon, you know, leaves, right? Like gets really angry at Philo and leaves. But um, but it, it it really is aimed at, at Cleanthes. And you know, how can Cleanthes answer it. And, and the, the way it's aimed at Cleanthes is um, that Cleanthes' proof is not a priori. Cleanthes' proof is a posteriori. So it's supposed to work like this. The world looks like it was made by uh, um, intelligent and uh, uh, rational being. 
that is, the world is analogous to machines. It's machines we know were made by rational creatures with an intellect and a will. Therefore, the world also probably was made by an intelligent being with an intellect and a will. So, um, but Philo says, um, I mean, I guess even like up to that point, it's still not an objection to Cleanthes either. Right? I mean, the world is full of misery and wickedness, but it still does bear an analogy to a machine. <laughs> and I, I think as Philo says, like, but the question is, what should we think this the, the aim of this machine is? Right? Like, what is it trying to produce? And so it's if that if you try to add in the moral attributes of God. As opposed to these uh, metaphysical attributes of int intellect and will and power, we try to add in the moral attributes of benevolence and justice. Philo says, this world doesn't look like it's a machine that was designed to produce happiness and, uh, and justice. It looks like a machine, but it looks like a machine that is just to produce, uh, designed to produce a whole bunch of stuff and like, and and give each species of thing exactly as much as it needs to not go extinct. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so I'll give you, you know, Philo's like, okay, I'll concede your argument from design, but I'll say that it doesn't look like you've proved that. Uh, uh, that God is, um, well, worthy of worship, <laughs> but now in a, in a different sense, right? That is like, is admirable. <laughs> um, so Cleanthes, I mean, it's, it seems like, so like, I guess, I mean, the simple form of the argument is, is this, like, if we say God is infinitely wise, powerful, oh, oh my gosh. yay. <laughs> that's too late to move over there all right if we say that god is infinitely wise powerful and good um if that's what we want to conclude so and we start with this world that's wicked and miserable well it seems like that's going to be really hard right because oh um, you know, and then Philo quotes Epicurus as saying, you know, if uh, 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 if God wills the world to be good, um, then uh, God must not be infinitely powerful. And whereas if God is infinitely powerful, he must not will the will to will, will to be good. <laughs> um, but uh, it seems like Cleanthes has already um. What should I say first? So one thing is that you can say, and this is the last thing Demia tries before Demia leaves. One thing you can try is say, well, uh, but, you know, in some other life or whatever, this will all be compensated for, right? And it will turn out that everything all put together 
is actually right. So it's, I mean, it's one of the things Descartes says in the fourth meditation, it's what Leibniz says, that this is the best of all possible worlds, whatever, right? That, that you know, this misery and wickedness is local, but it's actually necessary as part of a larger pattern for some reason. Now, I mean, Philo is a little bit like, really, if you're infinitely powerful? <laughs> but, but I mean, but he has a stronger argument than that because he says, remember, the Mia, the Anthony's argument is a posteriori. So, like, we don't know in advance that God is infinitely wise, powerful, and good. We're just supposed to take whatever we know about the world and conclude that from it. So, like, even if it's even if this world is consistent with a God like that, that's what we know of it. Even if it's consistent with a God like that, uh, it is an evidence for a God like that. Right, like all the, consi the consistency just shows that this is possible, but we want to show that it's actually true. <laughs> so, um, um, so for that, you have to find something in the world as we know it that points in this direction, um, and that's basically so. That's also how Philo heads off Cleanthes' defense because Cleanthes says. You know, and maybe he was thinking this all all along. Cleanthe says, you know, I don't really think, you know, this infinite word really is very helpful here. <laughs> Ray Cleanthe is just like, uh, you know, I think what we should conclude from the world is that is that uh, God is very much wiser and more powerful than us and is benevolent, but, you know, not infinitely. So, like, there were limits to what he could do. He only had so much material to work with and whatever, and this is the best he could do. Um, but again, Philo comes back and says, um, that shows that this is, it's, I mean, it's true that if you cut out infinitely, then it seems to really, starts to really seem like, yes, this is consistent with the misery and wickedness of the world, right? Because now it's easy to see that there's some considerations we don't know about, right? That there's a cost-benefit analysis. And even though this is pretty bad, it would have been worse if he had done it some other way, right? So, but Philo says, but again, that would make sense if you're going in this direction, right? Like if you already know this. So he has this little story, right? About someone who, uh, uh, like a, uh, someone, a limited intelligence like ourselves, who before they enter the world, someone assures them that it's the work of a wise, powerful, and benevolent being, right? And Philo says, you know, they would probably imagine a pretty different thing than what they actually see when they come into this. But Philo says, yeah, it's true. They would look at that and they would say, but, you know, I've been assured that it's the work of a wise, powerful, benevolent being. And I know that I'm very limited and whatever. And so, um, uh, yeah, this is this doesn't disprove it. It's just disappointing, right? But um, but Philo says, but if you start this way and you don't know this at all, <laughs> then the fact that this isn't what you would expect shows that it's not evidence. Okay. So, like, that's kind of where the discussion of these proofs ends. <laughs> um, uh, well, almost, I guess I would say, because what happens then is that Demia leaves, right? And so we, we don't know, I think we would like to know what would Demia say if Pantheles wasn't there? We don't get to find that out, but we do get to see what Philo would say when Demia isn't there. Um, 
So what happens is, um, that Philo suddenly turns around and claims that he really agrees with Cleanthes. <laughs> um, right, and he says, and you know that you know this too, right? Because I live with you in unreserved intimacy. <laughs> so uh, you know, Cleanthes and Philo know each other really well. I guess that has something to do with the fact that Philo's name is Philo. Okay? I don't know. But anyway, so, uh, and Demia, although he's also kind of a, presented as being a friend of them by Campos, but they don't really seem to think of him as their friend. <laughs> anyway, so, um, um, so Philo says, you know, the truth is, I agree with you not about natural religion. And, you know, these objections that I've been raising are like everything Cleanthes has been saying all along. Philo is like, you know, you're right. These objections that I've been raising are, are like abstruse, weird stuff that I'm coming up with. And, you know, like, um, I mean, it's a very Hume thing to say, actually, what he says, there, right? That's why I think there's a lot of uncertainty about who's speaking for you with this dialogue, right? So Philo, and at what point they're speaking for you? Because Philo says that, but you know, this kind of abstract argument has like has no effect on our natural reaction to the world, right? Like a, so, it right? It's, it's just like what Hume says about uh, the existence of external objects. Right, that I can raise this argument that 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 shows that it doesn't make any sense and it couldn't be true and whatever. But he says, you know, but I don't, you know, half an hour from now, you're going to believe in external objects again. You know, nature will take care of that. <laughs> right. Um, so, like, Philo says the same thing here. Right. He says, like, no one with good sense could ever look at the um all the intricate fitting of means to ends and whatever in the world and not instantly think that it must be the creation of a wise and powerful and benevolent being um um which is not as implausible as it might seem to us. I mean, you have to remember this was before Darwin, right? Now, I mean, it's true. Philo gets very close at some point. <laughs> um, but people had gotten very close since antiquity <laughs> to, to, you know, the theory of evolution by variation and natural selection. But he just doesn't quite get to it. Um, so, and it's true, without that theory, it's, you know, it's, I mean, people said it, um, but it's, it, it's hard to believe that eyes weren't made for seeing, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, look how, how complicated it is and everything's just right, you know. So, um, so it's possible at this point, Philo is telling the truth about what he thinks. And I'm gonna raise some doubts about that in a second. <laughs> um, and instead the two of them start a new argument, right? So they say, yeah, really we agree about natural, about natural religion. We agree that natural religion is this um, rational belief that there's a wise and powerful benevolent being that caused the world and um, uh, and of course, like the religion you get out of that is going to be a nice religion. <laughs> right? It's going to be um, 
It's not going to have inquisitors and holy wars and all that stuff, right? Because um, you're not going to be able to believe that a wise, powerful, and benevolent being would want you to do all that, <laughs> right? Like, or even like, would um, would be subject to like. As Philo says, one of the lowest of human passions, the the like desire for applause, <laughs> right? That like we get really angry if people didn't believe him or, or something, right? And also Philo says would would be subject to that passion and yet would not be as not um, enough like human beings to not care what like contemptible inferiors think about. It. <laughs> Right. So, um, uh, you know, so instead, like, we're going to say, you know, uh, um, um, uh, God isn't really going to care whether you believe the right thing or not. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, God is going to care whether you do the right thing. He's going to try to put incentives for you to do the right thing. But he's not really going to care whether, what you believe. Um, but it turns out that they just they still disagree about something. Or they disagree about a new thing because Philo says, yeah, and you know, what I was doing with Demia, the thing is, this is the true good religion, but the bad kind of religion, which he calls superstition or bigotry, right? It, so the word bigot, like, I'm not sure exactly how this transition happened, but it originally meant like religious fanatic. Um, like someone who has no tolerance for other religious opinions. That's what it originally meant. And somehow it got transferred. Now we associate it with racism. I'm not sure why. But they, so when they when they say Demia is a bigot, that's what they mean. Right? So um so the bad religion is called superstition or bigotry, you know. Now, I mean This is a typical move that Hume does all the time because, like, if you're, uh, the Church of England considers us itself to be between superstition, which is Catholicism on one hand, and bigotry, which is like radical Protestantism on the other hand. Right. So like if you know, if you um if you talk about the bad kind of superstitious bigoted religion or whatever, but like it's um easy for the Anglican to think, oh, but not us, right? <laughs> but I don't I mean Hume doesn't mean that, right? Um by the bad kind of religion, and they're they're pretty explicit about this. They mean the kind of religion that almost anyone has except philosophers. Right? So, uh, but um, so Philo says, you know, uh, we're we're perfectly agreed about this good religion and how important it is. But don't you agree, Cleanthes, that the bad religion is so bad that um, we should work to undermine it as much as possible? Right, so like that, so so that's what Philo says. That's why when I get someone like Demia, I try to drive them to the point of absurdity or impiety. <laughs> right, and he says it's usually not very hard to get both. <laughs> right, so um, um, and I guess the idea being. But now that Amia is gone, I want to make sure Pamphilus knows what I really think. <laughs> right? So, um, but then Cleanthe says, no, I disagree with you. This is, I mean, it, yes, it's true. This is the true religion, the philosophical religion. 
but um, um, but the other kind of popular religion is essential to society. And so we should let it be and uh, like not um, point to the problems in it. I mean, I don't know if that's exactly consistent with what Cleanthes was doing before. I mean, Cleanthes isn't very gentle with Demia either. And he goes to the point of, of saying that all traditional theology is atheism, basically. <laughs> I mean that's pretty that's pretty strong, but uh, oh, but okay. In any case, at this point, that's the argument. So the argument has switched from, I mean, instead of talking about God, now we're talking about religion, and religion is like a human institution that has certain causes and effects and whatever. Um, and there's all kinds of questions you can ask about it, uh, regardless of what other kinds of beings you think exist, right? Like whatever metaphysics you have. And uh, right, so um, so the argument now is, Cleanthe says, this is on page 82, part 12. Um, Religion, however corrupted, is still better than no religion at all. Why? And this is basically channeling Locke. The doctrine of a future state is so strong and necessary a security to morals that we never ought to abandon or neglect it. For if finite and temporary rewards and punishments have so great an effect as we daily find, how much greater must be expected from such as are infinite and eternal? Right? So Cleanthes is saying, like, as long as this religion believes that God has a power to reward and punish, and I mean, I guess it doesn't have to be infinite, right? As I pointed out when we talked about Locke, it just has to be bigger than any human <laughs> power, right? So uh, um, then it's a good thing because it convinces people to um, be moral because they're afraid. So Philo says, and this is interesting, I remember this is kind of topical, even though it was a long time ago, the situation was equally, no, I guess it wasn't as bad. We didn't know how much worse it could get. Anyway, this is a conversation I had with someone in Jerusalem. <laughs> so, um, and like, I, I don't remember, we were like, you know, in a cafe together and they were giving a kind of, um, Well, a kind of uh, crude, like esoteric, exoteric version of religion. I mean, they were saying something like, you know, I, I don't think any of this philosophical religion is any good, but um, we shouldn't tell anyone because it's the basis of society. And I was like, it's the basis of society? Like, do you remember where we are and what's going on here? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And that's basically what Philo says to Cleanthes. Ray, Philo is like, um, well, I don't know about that in theory, but let's look at the facts. <laughs> and he says, like, um, as soon as you read in a history that, that a certain period was characterized by lots of religion, you know what's coming. <laughs> blood and destruction, right? So, um, um, and on the other hand, he says, no period of time can be happier or more prosperous than those in which religion is never regarded or heard of, right? I guess he's thinking about like the, the Augustan age of Rome is probably what he's thinking of. Um, that's usually an example that people give of this. Tibet as well. Well, in Tibet, I don't know if either part of it is true. In Tibet, there's plenty of religion, and they had religious wars in Tibet. <laughs> but there's uh, there's areas where they they don't have uh, like well technically uh, 
squeeze it is in the pitch. So, uh, oh, well, it's based on still wow. Okay, I mean, I don't want to get an argument about about what Buddhism is. I mean, it's it's not a religion in this sense, but right. it seems like it, it is a religion in the sense that they're talking about now. You know, it has a priesthood and it has dogma and it has, and like I said, in Tibet, they had the different sects like went to war with each other, right? So it's like, um, it's not the kind of religion that, that Philo and Cleanthes agree is good. I, which is not to say that like, um, there couldn't be a quote unquote purified version of it. It would be right, but you know. So, but the point is, I don't think Tibet is what he's thinking of as an example. But I think he's thinking of like the time, the at least supposed time in the Roman Empire when the old religion had kind of lost its force. But I mean, the truth is, there were a lot of weird religious cults at that time. No, but anyway, <laughs> has there any? Has there ever been a time? Without yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I, yeah. Well, like I said, I'm trying to propose what Philo is probably thinking about when he talks yeah. about a time with no religion. You know, um, uh, um, you may um, also be t thinking about times when religion wasn't taken so seriously, like before the Reformation in England, maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure what exactly he has in mind, but um, So, um, so there's two parts here, right? The first is that Philo thinks, says he agrees with Cleanthes about true religion. And the other is that they disagree about corrupted religion, whether it's better than nothing or whether it's worse than nothing. So about the first part, and this raises some kind of question about that unreserved intimacy that Philo was talking about, because it's not obvious that Philo was really conceding much to Cleanthes. Um, So Philo says, like, I mean, as I said, Philo first says, you know, and this is so natural an argument, but, but none of my you know, like objections can touch it. And then he says, and in fact, I don't really think that there's that much difference between atheists and theists. They really pretty much, the atheists really pretty much do believe in God. It's just a verbal dispute. Why is that? Well, so he says this is how he's going to challenge the atheist, who I assert is only nominally so and can never possibly be in earnest. This is the bottom of page 80. I ask him whether from the coherence and apparent sympathy in all the parts of the world, there, not, there be not a certain degree of analogy among all the operations of nature in every situation and every age, whether the rotting of a turnip, the generation of an animal, and the structure of human thought be not energies that probably bear some remote analogy to each other. It is impossible he can deny it. He will readily acknowledge it. Okay, so, so far, all we have is that everything that happens in the world is like even things that seem really different, like the rotting of a turnip and a human mind are, yeah, they bear some analogy to each other. How is this gonna be used against the atheist? Having obtained this concession, I push him still further in his retreat and I ask him, 
if it be not probable that the principle which first arranged and still maintains order in this universe bears not also some remote inconceivable analogy to the other operations of nature, among the rest to the economy of human mind and thought. However reluctant he must give his assent. And then at the end of this argument, there's a footnote. Hume adds a footnote. So I take it in a footnote, and maybe the only place in the book where Hume is speaking in his own voice. But it seems irrelevant, actually. Because the footnote is about the dispute between skeptics and dogmatists being entirely verbal. Right? Remember, uh, dogmatism is just the opposite of skepticism, technically, right? So dogmatist doesn't mean like people who are really stubborn in their beliefs or don't have release to no reason or whatever. It just means like philosophers who think they can prove something. <laughs> and right, and as Hume says in this footnote that really it's, they're just disagreeing. It's just different degrees of doubt. Right, and they're just disagreeing about like how much, how much is enough certainty or whatever. But but Philo wasn't talking about that, right? Philo was talking about atheism versus theism. Um, well. So what has Philo proven at this point? What has Philo got the atheist to concede? Well, he's got the atheist to concede that um, the relationship of God to a human mind is um, possibly as close as the relation of a rotting turnip, turnip to a human mind. <laughs> Right? Like, I mean, yeah, there's some remote, remote analogy, <laughs> but it's, um, um, uh, it's not what Cleanthes wanted. Right, Cleanthes didn't want to conclude that God is it is as much, at least as much like a human mind as a rotting turnip is. <laughs> Cleanthes wanted to conclude that God is a lot like a human mind, only better. Right, um, and you know, I mean, when Cle this 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 cast doubt, the fact that Philo goes to this argument cast doubt on the thought that he really agrees with Cleanthes about the true religion. Because the one thing Cleanthes said about the true religion was, um, the proper office of religion is to regulate the hearts of men, humanize their conduct, infuse the spirit of temperance, order, and obedience. Um, well, that's I guess that's the end. And infuse the, the spirit of temperance, order, and obedience. In the end, it starts to sound a little bit sinister. <laughs> well, but I mean, but it's it's in line with Hume's politics, actually. I mean, Hume thinks that order and obedience are pretty important. Um, that you know, not as much as Hobbes, but he's he's pretty worried about the possibility of anarchy and civil war, or whatever. So. Um, Right. So anyway, so so Cleanthes wants religion to have this practical outcome, but Philo later claims, after he's given the argument he really agrees with, he goes on to say that the good thing about this true religion is that it has no practical effects. It just leaves it just leads to a calm speculative contemplation of the conclusion. <laughs> Now, I mean, at the end, Philo, so so what? 
what does Philo think? Uh, would humanize conduct and so on and so forth. Well, at the end, Philo says, suddenly, because remember, the whole thing is about natural religion. At the end, Philo suddenly says, and now he really does seem to be, in, again, in deep disagreement with Cleanthes. Philo says, you know, um, and the truth is, what's good about natural religion is precisely that it leaves us almost completely uncertain about the nature of the deity. Is God like a human? Is God like a rotting turnip? Is God infinitely perfect? We don't know. <laughs> and then Philo says, um, A person seasoned with a just sense of the imperfections of natural reason will fly to revealed truth with the greatest avidity, while the haughty dogmatist, persuaded that he can erect a complete system of theology by the mere help of philosophy, disdains any further aid and rejects this adventitious instructor. To be a philosophical skeptic is, in a man of letters, the first and most essential step towards becoming being a sound believing Christian, a proposition which I had willingly recommend to the attention of Pamphilus. Right, so, so officially Philo's conclusion at the end of the dialogue is that um, the purpose of natural religion is to lead to a skeptical conclusion and to make you realize that you need revealed religion. But um, if there's one thing in the book that I'm pretty sure that Hume doesn't agree with, it's that thing at the end. <laughs> right? I mean, and I'm pretty sure Philo doesn't agree with it either. Because you just have to ask one thing, which Locke already asks, right? How do you know it's revealed? What's the evidence? Um, so, um, why is Philo saying this? I mean, you could say, why is Hume saying it? Because of the censor. I don't know. Or you could say, why is Philo saying it? Because after all, Philo doesn't want to convince Pamphilus not to be a Christian. Or, because Philo thinks Pamphilus is smarter than Cleanthes and will, will get the point and Cleanth doesn't want to make Cleanthes mad. But from the letter to Hermippus, it doesn't appear that that worked. Of course, we don't know who Hermippus is. But anyway, um, um, but so I don't think that's the real story for Philo. What is the real story? Well, like, so this is the mo the the uh, moral that Philo takes um, right after he actually makes that argument that theists and atheists are not that different from each other. Um, consider then where the real point of controversy lies. And if you cannot lay aside your disputes, endeavor at least to cure yourselves of your animosity. Right, I think Philo thinks that Skepticism is the basis of morality. <laughs> and now Hume's footnote is relevant, <laughs> right? Because that's what Philo is really talking about here and what Hume is really talking about here. That, um, um, Religion, where the natural revealed, is not what's going to make people moral. What's going to the, the only thing that can make people treat each other better is for them to be less sure that they're right. <laughs> um, and that's what philosophers should be trying to teach. Um,
do I agree with that? Not exactly, maybe, but close enough that that's why I was kind of half joking last time that if someone asked, you know, so what are you doing to make the world better? <laughs> why aren't you posting like pro-Israel or anti-Israel memes on your Facebook feed? Because we know that's what really works. <laughs> No, but I mean, why aren't you building barricades? And I, and I would say, well, what I'm doing is I'm teaching them a dialogue concerning natural religion. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I guess I do agree with it to this extent, which is that uh, if philosophers could make people more moral, it would only be by example. <laughs> and we're not doing that well, but that's what we should be trying to. <laughs> all right. That is all I have to say. And uh, it's just on time. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming. And uh, have a good summer. And I, I will be um, having office hours tomorrow. If you want to see me after that, you should get in touch and we can make an appointment. Back in the fall or? No, I'm going to be on leave next year. My leave was just was just approved. <laughs> Finally, well, thank you. Um, but, uh, yeah, so have a good summer. Have a good year. <laughs> See you around. <laughs>